The story of the gospel, a story above all stories, a story that's been told now for 2,000 years, a story that hasn't changed, a story that's lived on, a story that continues to rule, continues to capture the imagination, capture the minds, and capture the hearts of untold hundreds of millions of people. Imagine as we are gathered here today once again in honor of that story and how that story is being played out in our own lives or how that story can be played out in your life beginning this Easter. That your life can change from this moment forward based on how you allow this story to intercept the storyline of your life so that God can change the storyline of your life. A story that now in the world today, some 2,000 years later, it started with a handful of people that arrived at the tomb on that first Easter morning. But now 2,000 years later, there are 2 billion people on planet Earth that profess that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Count it, 2 billion. Let's look at that story, the good news. Uh, the, the, the word is gospel, and the word gospel simply means good news. So let's look at the gospel or the good news according to Luke and how he described the first Easter in Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, which happened to be Sunday for the Hebrews, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. They were going, thinking they were going to find a, a dead corpse. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but is risen. Okay. That was your chance to jump into the story here. Okay because we're still part of this story. So, God's a God of a second chance. Don't worry, all the other services missed that opportunity, but I'm going to give you another chance. So, here we go. Get ready. Here's what the angel said. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but is risen. Yeah. Yeah. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified? And the third day rise again, and they remembered his words. How easy it is to forget the words of Jesus. And the disciples, the early disciples, forgot the promise of Jesus that he had to go through what he went through, but that on the third day he would rise again. Verse 9, then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them, who told these things to the apostles. And that tells us who were the first ones, once again, who were the first ones to witness the resurrected Christ. It wasn't the head honchos. It wasn't the apostles. It was the women. And when the women came back and told them what had happened, look at verse 11. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. Can you believe that? But verse 12, Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves. Ah, evidence. And he departed marveling to himself at what had happened. Let's pray. God, thank you for this story above all stories. The one story in a world filled with stories, the one story that matters most, the one story that can change the storyline in everyone's heart and life, no matter what their story has been like up to this moment, this story can superimpose itself and create a whole new storyline of love and peace and redemption and forgiveness. I pray that now, Lord, that everyone in the sound of my, my words would, would hear the message of Christ and would respond to the Holy Spirit. I ask this in the name of Jesus, and everyone said, amen. amen. So God's message on Easter hasn't changed. God's message on Easter is timeless. God's message on Easter is enduring in a world that is filled with messages, in a world that is 
filled with messy messages in our world. Let me give you an interesting fact. You know, young people, uh, they send, when it comes to messaging or texting, they send almost 10 times as many text messages as, say, someone my age or older, right? According to recent research, they found that 18 to 24-year-olds send 2,022 text messages per month on average. That's 67 text messages a day. I mean, can you kid, are you kidding me? 67 text messages? That would drive me crazy. You know, some of you may be in church right now and you're texting. I would advise you to not do that, okay? We have this, we have this new camera called a jib, and it could practically reach to the opposite end of the auditorium, and it could look down at what you're texting. So I'm just I'm giving you a heads up. Now, when it comes to text messaging, because, you see, contrast all the messages in the world today that are being sent over mass communication and how short-lived they really are. And yet, Easter is a message that rules, that endures, that continues. Guess what the hottest and latest trend is related to text messaging? It's a disappearing text message. For example, they have all these apps that are out, right, like Snapchat, Okay, uh, it ensures that your, your note, your message, will self-destruct after the person you sent it to has viewed it, leaving no trail or no trace behind it. Imagine, self-destructing messages, right? So Easter reminds us that the message of Jesus and the message of Easter does not self-destruct, right? Easter is a timeless message in a deletable age. Now, speaking of self-destructing messages, I remember as a young kid, I remember growing up and watching the original Mission Impossible. It was a television series. It ran from like 1966 to 1973. And each episode, it started the same way. The leader of the team of these uh, exceptional spies would receive a top secret message. And it would go something like this. Your message, Jim, should you decide to accept it. And then it would give the details of this mission, right? And then it would end by saying, as always, should you or any of the IM force be caught or killed, the secretary will disavow any knowledge of you and your actions. This message will self-destruct in five seconds. Good luck, Jim. And every time, like this little tape recorder thing would just turn into smoke, right? Like self-destruct. And think about it. The message of Christ and the message of Easter doesn't self-destruct. It, it can't be deleted. You see, today's teenagers, this generation of teenagers, they've been labeled Generation Delete. You know why young people have been labeled Generation Delete? Because in this tech-centric world that we live in today, young people have never known a life without the option to erase. <laughs> it's like the erasable generation, right? There's only one problem with that, and I'm sure, young people, your parents have told you this, and if they haven't, let me tell you this. Anything and everything you do on the internet, everything and anything you do electronically, there is always a trace to it. It never really ever disappears. Now, we need to tell that to some of our high government officials who think they can delete emails and wipe a hard drive clean and, and not be caught. You know, everything is permanent. We think it's not, but it really is. Now, among these, these apps, because see, I'm an old guy and I'm having to kind of keep up with, with technology, as I mentioned, Snapchat will allow you to take photos and videos and send a message to a friend with a timer attached to it. And as soon as they view the picture, see the picture, view the video, or read the text message, then it disappears. Uh, there's another app called Yik Yak. Where do they get these names, right? Yik Yak. It allows you to send an anonymous message that is only visible to users within a mile and a half radius of your present location, right? And then there's another app called The Secret App, which, uh, as its name suggests, lets you send nameless messages with no trace back to your advice. And then there's another one called What, W-U-T, and it lets your message be totally anonymous. Now, let's, let's be honest. All of us uh, wish that we had the ability to take back maybe an email that we sent to a friend or family member or a coworker. How many of you ever sent an email that you wish could be deleted, right? But it was too late. Uh, how many sent a text that you wish 
you hadn't have sent that text. Or you sent the text that you wanted for a special person to the wrong person, and they sent back a like, what? <laughs> and you're like, sorry, that was from my uh, wife. <laughs> yeah. Explain that one. Now it's permanent, right? I was, uh, my wife and I, as I've mentioned, we had the privilege of being in the Holy Land two weeks ago. And, and what a joy. I'll say more about that in a moment. But uh, we were in, in our hotel, and a lot of other tourists were in that hotel, and we kind of all ate in the same eating area, like a buffet. And afterwards, they, have the, they had this lounging area that you could uh, retire to and go get, you know, some coffee or something to drink. So uh, the pastors that we were traveling with, we were all sitting down, and a couple of us went over, you know, to get some, order some drinks, some coffee. And there was uh, another group of individuals, some tourists that were there. And one of the older gentlemen walked up the same time we did. And I thought I would just be nice and spark up a conversation with him. And I uh, said, so, hey, where are you all from? He said, uh, well, uh, some of our group's from England, and then some of us are from. And then I, then I, couldn't under, I, didn't, I didn't pick it up. I couldn't understand what he was saying. He had like a thick accent, and, and I didn't really pinpoint the accent, but I wanted to be friendly, so I thought I would try to relate to him. So I remembered, you know, that he said a part of his group is from England. So I said, long live the queen. And he looked at me and he said, I'm Scottish. My mother's from Ireland. Those are fighting words. <laughs> and I'm glad he's an old guy because I could have taken him. I mean, I'm pretty sure of that. But uh, he, he kind of got a kick out of it. And I said, uh, hey, sorry. Long live William Wallace. Yeah. <laughs> Tried to redeem myself there. We all wish that there were times that maybe we've said something, we've sent something that we wish we could delete, that we could cancel out, that we could take back. You see, that's the society. That's the generation that we live in today. And we see that so many people are trying to work overtime to try to cancel out, try to erase, try to delete the Easter story. But it rules It endures, and it doesn't self-destruct. It's not temporary. It is permanent. And the story of Easter is not just for a select few within a a mile-and-a-half radius of the city of Jerusalem. It wasn't just for a certain group of people within a 200-mile radius of the city of Jerusalem. No, 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 no. The message of Easter is for the whole world, right? Because Christ died for the whole world. For God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son. And so the story of Easter is for everyone, and it cannot be and will not be deleted or canceled out or negated. I mean, Easter is the most incredible message of hope and redemption and joy and forgiveness. Because the only thing that was canceled out, the only thing that was deleted on Easter was death itself. Jesus is the only one that's ever lived and that has has ever or ever will live that did something about the biggest monster that faces all of our lives, the reality of our our mortality, the reality of death. You know, the Bible says that death is the greatest fear of man. It's the bondage of fear, the fear of death, that we, the human race, have, have been living under ever since the creation of Adam. Now, some people might think, well, you know, hey, that's Carl, man, I don't fear death. Uh, on this trip to the Holy Land, one of our pastors was afraid of heights. Now, we all have something. If we're honest, we all have something, something that we're afraid of. This pastor was afraid of heights, uh, which meant if, when, if we were on the Mount, uh, of Mount Carmel uh, and you're looking down this, this, you know, hundreds of feet down below to the ground, and there's just a small rail that's there, I'm like, cool, let's take a picture. I don't want to drop my phone, though, right? He was like, I'm not getting near that. And we were on Masada, you know, we're, we're looking, we're on, we're on this, we're thousands of feet in the, in the air, right, looking down. He's like, I'm not getting close to that. He was literally afraid of heights. But really, he wasn't afraid of heights. He's afraid of what the heights could do to him if he fell over the edge and suddenly hit the bottom. That's really what he was afraid of. When people say, I'm afraid of snakes, no, you're really not afraid of snakes. What you're afraid of is you're afraid of being bitten by a snake and what the consequences of a snake bite might be in your life. But the Easter message, which is not a deletable message, which is an enduring message, which is an an, an eternal message, is a message of life in the face of death, because Jesus himself conquered it. Uh, No other religious figure in the history of the world, no other other, uh, religious leader in the history of the world has ever made the claims that Jesus Christ has made about himself, about himself. 
No followers of any religion or any religious leader in the history of the world have ever made the claims that the followers of Jesus make, i.e., that he was raised from the dead on the third day, that you can search high and low throughout the entire earth. You will not find the body. You will not find the corpse. You will not find the skeletal remains of one Jesus of Nazareth. What an outlandish claim, the claim of Christianity. When we were in the Holy Land two weeks ago, which was an incredible blessing, you know, prior to Palm Sunday and and now Easter weekend, to actually be in the city where all of this took place. We were at the garden tomb. There in the garden tomb, uh, you walk to one end of the garden tomb and you look at the place of the skull, the place where they believe that Jesus or the vicinity of where Jesus was crucified. It's called place of the skull because even 2,000 years later, uh, the side of the, the, the rock formation there looks like a skull. You can Google it. You, it's, you, know, you can see the picture. It looks like a skull. And it's along a, a main road that would lead in and out of Jerusalem even 2,000 years ago. And the Romans would, would intentionally crucify their, their criminals on a cross to be displayed before the whole world to flex their, their power and to intimidate those who would come against Rome. But where the place of the skull is, you can look over and there's the garden tomb. Uh, The garden tomb is the tomb that they believe. Uh, They're not 100% sure, but that's the the tomb that they believe was Joseph of Arimathea's tomb where Jesus, upon being taken down from the cross at three in the afternoon on Good Friday, was placed, his dead corpse, his dead body was placed in that tomb. And then a stone was rolled over that tomb and guards were posted Outside of the tomb, the sealed tomb with a stone sealed, guarded by Romans, because uh, the rumor had it that the disciples were going to try to come and steal the body of Jesus, because on many occasions, Jesus made the claim that you could tear down this temple, but in three days, I will raise it up again, speaking of his resurrection. So Rome was on high alert to ensure that that didn't happen, and yet It did happen. (laughs) Not that his disciples came to steal his body away, no, but that the stone was rolled away. And and as you and I know, you've heard many Easter sermons before, the stone was rolled away not to let Jesus out. The stone was rolled away to allow us in to see the evidence that he's no longer here but is risen. And imagine for those uh, that may be in service today that are exploring the claims of Christianity, and maybe you're still a skeptic, okay, Set aside the historical evidence that's out there. Set aside the archaeological evidence that is out there. Set aside the biblical narrative and the, and the, the biblical revelation of God in Scripture concerning who Jesus is. Set aside the two billion people on planet Earth some 2,000 years later that believe the story of Easter. Set aside all of that. What's the real evidence that Jesus Christ is alive? Because there's a mountain of evidence. You see... Even the, Jesus, even the disciples of Jesus initially heard the words of the women coming back from the tomb on that first Easter, and they thought it was idle chatter. They thought it was a fantasy. They thought it was a lie. And yet they became so convinced themselves because they themselves saw Jesus. Jesus appeared after the resurrection to over 500 eyewitnesses. Over 500 eyewitnesses that testified that they indeed had seen the risen Savior. So convincing was the evidence in the hearts and lives of the disciples that these men who initially were cowards hiding behind locked doors on that first Easter morning, only later after the women's prodding did they venture out to discover for themselves that the tomb was empty. These men, subsequent to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, these men were willing to lay down their lives, and ultimately it cost them martyrdom. They died for their faith. Now tell me, these same group of men that were fearful on the, day, the first Easter morning that were looking out trying to save their own bacon, because at the end of the day it's all about saving ourselves as human beings, why would they all of a sudden be willing to give their life if it were a lie. They wouldn't. So we were right outside the garden tomb in this beautiful area that, by the way, over 330,000 people every year from 90 different nations come to this place for themselves. And you can actually walk in the garden tomb. You can walk in the tomb 
We don't know for certain, but there's, there's high probability that this was the tomb of Jesus. But we do know it was in that vicinity. And so we're sitting outside of the tomb, and there's a little private area that groups can have communion, a little time of worship. And um, Pastor Dave McQueen, who uh, led this trip, uh, gave a devotional, and then he said, now I want each of you to share what this place, what this moment means to you. And it, and it, it uh, came around to my turn. And as I sat there and pondered his question, what does this place, what does this moment mean to you? I got emotional because I realized this is where it all happened. This story that cannot be erased, cannot be deleted, cannot be canceled. They've tried to stop it. They've tried to change it. They've tried to alter it. It all happened in this area. All that I know, all that I am today, all that I've experienced, all that I will ever be in the future, all that I will ever experience in eternity, it all hinges on this place and a tomb, if not that one, a tomb like that one, where my Jesus was buried, but on the third day was raised to life again. And it hit me. It's real. And I know, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, I know that it's real and I know that Jesus lives. Why? Because you have seen him with your physical eyes? No. But I have seen him. I can remember as a, as a lost sinner, undone, away from God, and yet God's love for me was unconditional and con- continuously reaching out to me. I can remember as I began, as a lost sinner, to read the Scriptures, to read the story of Jesus in the Gospels, and I saw Jesus for myself like I had never seen him before in the Gospels, right? Then I reached a point, the Holy Spirit brought me to a point of total, complete surrender, and I cried out for God's mercy, and I cried out for Jesus to come and rescue me and to save me, and he came into my life, and now I know he lives, not just because of the historical evidence or the archaeological evidence or the divine revelation of who Jesus is in Scripture or because somebody else told me. I now know beyond a shadow of a doubt that what took place 2,000 years ago outside of that garden tomb, I know it's real because I know something with absolute certainty. He lives inside my heart. You see, nobody could change my life. I could not even change my life. No one can change your life. Attempt after attempt after attempt of others Outside influences can attempt to change your life, but no one can change your life. You can't even change your own life, but Jesus can change a life. And the way Jesus changes a life is just so amazing. It never ceases to amaze me. He changes a life from the inside out. You see, religion, it tries to change people from the outside in. I just read it this morning in my daily devotional reading through the Bible in a year, and I'm reading through the Gospel of Luke, and Jesus once again admonished, don't just wash the outside of the cup. Wash the inside of the cup. God is able to wash the inside of a man's heart, the inside of a woman's heart. And once God can clean up your heart and clean up my heart and change my heart and change your heart, he'll change what comes out of that heart. And out of the heart flows the issues of life, the Bible says. You see, if you're here today and you've not yet surrendered your life to Christ, or maybe you're straddling the fence, maybe you've got one foot in, one foot out, you know, and you're doing the spiritual hokey pokey. (laughs) And you're like, enough's enough. This demands complete and total surrender. No half-heartedness. No halfway in and halfway out. No, I'm serving him on Sundays and then I'm back to my old life on Monday. It's like, I'm all in. It's all or nothing. Hello, right? Because Jesus was all in for you and me. He hung on that cross, not for himself, not because he deserved to be there. He hung on that cross because you and I deserve to be there. And yet, he told the Father, I'll take their place. I'll take their place. And what makes Jesus a perfect Savior? Many of you know this. What makes Jesus a perfect Savior is that he was man, so he could grab the hand of man 
but he was also God, <laughs> so he could grab the hand of God. And at the cross, he grabbed the hand of God because he was sinless, and the hand of man that was sinful, and he reunited the Father with his creation. What a story. What a story. Tweet that one. Facebook that one. Instagram that one. Pinterest that one. Space time that one. <laughs> Whatever else they have these days. That's the story. And what will we do with it? What will you do with it? You see, Jesus is still in the life-changing business, and he's still changing lives. These women that were at the tomb on that first Easter, their lives were radically changed by Jesus. One woman had seven demons that tormented her life. Seven? I mean, one's bad enough. <laughs> seven? How would you like to be married to that woman, guys? <laughs> and then one day she comes home, and she, you don't recognize her. You're like, woman, what happened to you? She's like, I met Jesus. He's like, I want to meet this Jesus. Where would you meet this Jesus? Right? One woman that was caught in a very act of adultery, and the religious crowd dragged, drug her out to shame her, to condemn her, and to do what the law required under a theocracy, stone her. Adultery was punishable by death, capital punishment, under a theocracy. Now Jesus was introducing a new covenant in the New Testament, one of grace and mercy and forgiveness. And you know the story. Those that could have stoned her couldn't stone her because Jesus said that those of you that are without sin be the first to cast the stone. And everyone was convicted in their heart of their own sin because we're all sinners, yeah, all of us. Only Jesus stood there. At the end of the story, alone with this woman, and he said, woman, where are your accusers? He said, I have none, Lord. He said, neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. Her life was never the same again because she came in contact with Jesus. I'm sorry. If your first contact with God was through some religious experience that maybe turns you off from the things of God. You see, my first real encounter with Jesus, it can happen in a church, but it didn't for me happen in a church. It happened in the back bedroom of an apartment on the 90, 100, 90, 100, 900, 9800 block of Montgomery and Eubank in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it's going to come out. And it was there that I encountered the living Lord and Savior. He entered my room. He entered my heart. He changed my life. Each and every service this weekend, we've had a traditional altar call. Each and every service, last night, the two before this one, people have responded to that altar call. What are they responding to? They're responding to the call of God, the invitation of heaven to come and be in relationship with Jesus Christ. They're answering the altar call not to join our church, although we don't turn anyone away who wants to follow Jesus. We would welcome you and come alongside of you and help you grow in your relationship with Christ. But they're answering this altar call because they're saying no to the life that they are currently living, and they're saying yes to the life that God is offering them, a life defined by joy and peace. And all the things that we were singing about and, and what was happening during the worship set and the exuberance and the joy that was on this platform, sometimes we might look at that and say, is it real? Yes, it's very real. It's not affected. It's not a performance. These individuals are worshiping God out of their own heart because they have this personal relationship with him, and you can have a personal relationship with him. Does that mean that when I come into a personal relationship with Jesus, that all my problems instantaneously are going to be canceled, deleted, and removed and erased? No. But it does make this promise. Because the fact that Jesus rose from the dead and he kept that promise it gives credibility, credibility to every other promise he's ever made. And the other promises that he has made, he's promised to never leave you nor forsake you, to be with you always, even to the end of the age. And the first thing that Jesus spoke to his disciples after the resurrection, when he appeared to them in John's Gospel, chapter 20, he said this, peace be with you. Can we say that together? Peace be with you. Look to your neighbor and say, peace 
be with you. It's a famous Hebrew word. It's the word shalom. Shalom means God's blessing, God's grace, God's prosperity, God's health, God's wholeness, God's mercy, God's love. It means more than just peace. But Jesus promised to give peace. Peace not as the world gives. Peace that's permanent. Peace that is beyond human comprehension. It's real. And no matter where you've been, no matter what your life has experienced, no matter the pain or the heartache or the brokenness that maybe your life has been associated with or maybe the good life that you've experienced, whatever, whatever side of the track you may find yourself on today, at today, Jesus offers peace and wholeness and redemption. Several months ago, an individual walked into our church. He was very noticeable because he had body piercing all throughout his face and his body. He was dressed in Gothic attire, completely black. He had a leash and a chain around his neck and a long leash that he drug behind him as he walked. And he came to this church looking for something. And what he found when he came to this church, not unlike many other churches in our community, but what he found when he came to this church is he found love and acceptance. He found in this church a group of individuals that didn't judge him based on what he looked like on the outside. And it struck him. He wasn't expecting that. He experienced love. He came the first Sunday, and then he came another Sunday, and then he came another and he eventually surrendered his heart and life to Jesus Christ. And my greatest proof to you that Jesus lives is not the historical, archaeological, or even the gloriously divine revelation of Christ in Scripture. It's the fact that Jesus is still changing lives today. I want to I wanna share the testimony of Taggart with you at this time. My story then it starts when I was a kid. When my parents divorced real young and I was always kicked to my uncle's house, which is my mom's brother. My uncle's best friend used to molest me when I was a kid. So, you know, I, I was jacked up and it pretty much just ruined me from the time I was a child, man. I grew up with a lot of real bad issues and, man, I got into drugs real, real early alcohol. A lot of weed, a lot of coke, snorting a lot of meth and I started shooting dope. And I stayed on meth for, oh my God, my whole life. So I learned to hate God when I was a kid, you know. I became a Satanist, and then I was an atheist, into Gothic, this kind of stuff like Marilyn Manson. I dressed like it for years. I, I had a trash load of piercings in my face. I was a professional piercer for a while. My whole life I've been manic depressive and extremely suicidal. You know, I've had a, an extreme suicide attempt. Well, I, cut, I cut myself up with a utility blade, man, real bad. Like my arm didn't work for a long time. I cut my throat like six times. And, and I realized over these years, man, that it wasn't, I was just mad, you know? I was just angry because God didn't do what I thought he should do in my life. And everything that I chased after just made me more hollow. You know? It just added to the emptiness regardless of what it was, drugs and money, and nothing could fill that hole. The only thing I was afraid of was to live and never be loved. I walked into Trinity and experienced I experienced some things that I'd never, I'd never believed in. I'd never believed possible. Like, one, that Jesus is real. And two, that there's like real Christians in the world who don't just talk about it, they walk about it. They loved me to Jesus, you know? They, could, they understood where I was at and they were able to come alongside me. They showed me the love of Christ because that's what I was looking for. You know, my whole life people always say, man, I love you, you know? But it was always just out of the mouth, you know what I'm saying? You could, I, could, I could tell the difference. And when I went to Trinity and Malta Farms, I could tell the difference. I felt the love of Jesus, man, and it just, it drew me closer to him, you know? I remember my very first time, which was the first day I went to Trinity, I met Pastor Carl and he was like, man, just, just keep coming back. I didn't know where I was going, but something inside me was stirring. I didn't know it was Jesus. I didn't know the Holy Spirit was stirring me up. I just knew that that, that was where I was supposed to be. I found that all the things that I had ever been chasing were the emptiness, you know, and that he's the fullness of everything. There's a, there's a peace inside of me that 
I could never even have comprehended or imagined, you know? And it's not the peace that lives within me is not dictated by my situation or my circumstances. All that I don't have now in the flesh, man, it's made up in so many ways in Christ, you know? There's the riches of his glory is what I have found, you know? He just loved me right where I was at and he was, he was, a, he was a genuine friend to me when I was completely and utterly friendless. Before I knew Christ, all I ever knew was darkness. I looked for this my whole life, and, and now I know what it's like to be loved. Now, what I, now I know what it's like to be loved. He now has peace. What Jesus promised to those who would surrender their life to him. We give him our brokenness. He gives us his wholeness. We give him our sin. He gives us his righteousness. We give him our hatred and prejudice, and he gives us his love and his grace. We give him an imperfect life, and he gives us a perfect God of love and grace and forgiveness. Who would say no to that? You know, Taggart was instantaneously changed because salvation is an instantaneous miracle. But sanctification, discipleship is a process that he's under, I'm still under 35 years later, surrendering my life to Jesus. Taggart's not where he wants to be, but he's not where he used to be, and he's on his way to where God wants him to be. And that journey can begin in your life right here, right now if you'll say yes to the invitation of Christ. Here's how it works. Revelation 3.20, Jesus said, I stand at the door of your heart and I'm knocking. If you will hear me and open up the door of your heart, I will come into you and I will have fellowship with you and you will have fellowship with me. A Savior that was willing to go through the shame of the cross because he loves you. He loves you as much now as he ever will. By you responding to this altar call, surrendering your life to Christ, isn't going to make God love you anymore. He loves you as you are, but he loves you too much to keep you the way you are. And he wants you to receive his love and grace in your life. I'd like everybody to stand. We're going to begin to sing this worship song. And I want to invite every person here today that has not yet surrendered their life to Christ but would like to begin to become a follower of Jesus. And everyone in here today that needs to rededicate their life to Christ as we begin to sing this song, you're not going to be the only one, but I'm wondering who will be the first one to make their way up to this altar. And then in a moment, I and the rest of this congregation will pray the most important prayer you'll ever pray, the prayer of salvation. If that's you, I want you to come right now in Jesus' name. Those of you that have come forward, please listen to me. I don't know how he does it. I'm talking about Jesus. I don't know how he does it. But every time an invitation is made and people respond, our hearts begin to warm within us as one great theologian explained his experience with Jesus. All of a sudden, the burdens that have been so heavy, the burdens of life begin to be lifted because the greatest of all miracles is about to take place. And here's what you need to know about Jesus. In John 6, 37, Jesus said this, all that come unto me I will in no wise send away. There's never been a soul that has sincerely come to Jesus, no matter how far gone that soul may be, that Jesus said, it's not for you. The Bible says, whosoever will, let him come and drink freely of the waters of life. Here's what I also know. As you open up your heart to receive Jesus, he's going to change everything about your life from the inside out. It begins today. Salvation is instantaneous, but the work of discipleship and the process of becoming more like Jesus is a day-by-day process. And his love and grace will be with you each and every day of your life, no matter what your struggles may be. I see husbands and wives up here. I see whole families up here. This is the beginning of something brand new. Here's what Scripture promises. It says, therefore, if any man or woman be in Christ, they become a new creation, something that's never existed before. The old is passed away. Behold, all things are made brand new. What's made brand new? The inside of you and me. The inside. Your heart becomes brand new. You say, okay, how does it happen? You see, religion complicates the process. Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship, and it simplifies it. Here's how it happens. 
The Bible says in Romans, the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 9, if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Verse 10, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made in salvation. You see, when two people get married, they exchange their vows with one another. They pledge their love and allegiance to one another. This is what salvation is like. At the cross, Jesus pledged his love to you and me. He pledged his loyalty to you and me. At a moment like this, we now respond back to that, however long it's taken, and we express our pledge of allegiance and loyalty back to Jesus. Let's pray this prayer out loud together. Dear God in heaven, I know I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. There's only one Savior. His name is Jesus. I call upon you, Jesus. I ask you now, come into my heart. Come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. I turn from sin to the true and living God. I receive his love, his grace, and his forgiveness. Dear God in heaven, you're now my father, and I am your child. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit and give me strength to live for you and serve you all the days of my life, beginning today for the rest of eternity. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we thank the Lord together?